The very early machines never really caught on, but this one did. Made by the BT company in Canada in about 1900, it's wonderful. You'll see it's got a great big wooden drum, and in there you put your water and your clothes, and it's got a dolly, look, just like the one I was using by hand, but this one is operated from outside the machine. So you just give it spinning like that, get up a great speed, wash your clothes beautifully, standing there casually. And look at this, a built-in mangle as well. What more could any housewife want? Well, there was actually one thing missing. Electricity. And this is how they installed it. Look, it's essentially the same machine. Wooden drum, same sort of legs. But, have a look inside. Instead of that dolly, it's got a rather smart agitator. If we could have some power, please. Switch it on and look. Very soothing, but they had two problems to overcome. The first was they needed an electric motor powerful enough to turn all those heavy wet clothes and all the water around. And second, they were mixing water with electricity. Have a look, the motor is right underneath the drum there. So any leaks and you'd go up in smoke. I think perhaps I'd rather not use this machine. Once they'd cracked the safety problem, the scene was set for an evolution in machines that would lead to domestic paradise for anyone who'd grown up with the drudgery of old-fashioned wash day. By the 1950s, the era of domestic white goods had arrived. What had once been status symbols for the rich were now within reach of normal people. A washing machine is something everyone can afford these days. The question is, which? After the war, the kitchen changed nature. From a simple food preparation area, it became a sort of science laboratory full of gleaming white apparatus. Let's look at some of the evolution. Here is a very early washing machine, 1947. It's terribly simple, doesn't even have a, a switch. You just plug it in and it goes, and it doesn't have any drying system except for this mangle. You put your clothes in there and all the water with luck goes back into the there. Then we have the spin dryer. This is separate freestanding, all right? So you have to take the clothes out of your machine, put them in there, and it has no way of emptying things. It's just a bucket underneath. So afterwards, you have to take out the bucket and tip it into the sink. This is the huge advance, the spin dryer with a pump. So you can put this into the sink and pump all the water into the sink. Huge step forward. And then comes the twin tub. Now, we had one of these. I love it. And you turn it on, and it has a terrific boiling action. And you put your clothes in. And I don't want to put my hands in there. And they get sucked under in a wonderful way and whirled round. The only problem is it tended to tangle them a bit. So it became known as the tangle-matic. And also the, the splash-matic. You can see water's going all over the kitchen. Let's see what it's done with those shirts. Yes, I think Tanglematic is a perfectly reasonable name for it. One of its rivals was advertised as the washing machine that does not tangle your clothes. Look at this wonderful machine. I have to turn the motor on and then turn the wash action on. And look, it has a wonderful... Oh, it's almost better than the telly, isn't it? Isn't it? For many people, a washing machine was the first major appliance they bought. But in the two decades following the Second World War, all sorts of other smaller and cheaper electrical gadgets made their way into our homes. And now, for the first time, people all over the country could have the luxury of a labour-saving vacuum cleaner. The history of vacuum cleaners goes back over a hundred years. In 1901, Hubert Cecil Booth, an Englishman, built an enormous machine drawn by horses and parked in the street with long suction pipes leading in through the windows. Then, six years later, a James M. Spangler built the very first electric vacuum cleaner. He was a janitor in an Ohio department store, and he found that cleaning the rugs made him sneeze. So using an electric fan and an old soapbox, he knocked up a prototype. And I've made one rather similarly. I've got a, an ordinary desk fan here, and you would expect to stand in front of this and have a wonderful cool breeze, but I've turned the blades round so it's going to blow the air that way, so on this side we'll have suction. And I've put that on my soapbox here so that when I switch on, 
it will suck the air up from below and indeed up this tube and I'll be able to suck up all that sawdust. And on the end to collect all the rubbish he had a pillowcase. And so I've got a pillowcase here. So let's switch on. Oh, hey, look, look, I've got a wonderful clean line. Very, very elegant. And now I just need to go back and make another parallel track. And in next to no time, I'll have the whole carpet entirely dust free. Spangler's device was patented on the 2nd of June 1908 and he began advertising what he called the electric suction sweeper, boasting to potential buyers modern sweeping by electricity and substantially made will last a lifetime. He wasn't wrong. It really is very substantial, this machine, but it's got some lovely little bits of decoration to appeal to the housewife. However, Spangler soon found he was getting attention from another sort of buyer, this rather stern-looking bloke. He was a saddle maker looking to diversify his business. His name was William Henry Hoover. And he liked the suction sweeper so much, he bought the company. And so now we call the whole thing hoovering. But he didn't invent it. It was Spangler who invented it. We should be Spanglering our floor. In the century since, Hoover has built many millions of vacuum cleaners. Quite a few of them are owned by Mike King. Hi, Mike. I, I've forgotten what a noise they make. It sounds like a truck, doesn't it? Such a roar. Yeah, and the light. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You've got a terrific collection. How long have you been collecting for? About five years. Really? Mm. Uh, how many have you got altogether? Uh, about 83. 83. When it comes to doing the vacuuming, Mike's only worry is which one to use. He's got all manner of manuals, cylinders and uprights, the first of which dates to the 1930s. The Goblin model on the end, the Goblin Wizard, basically nothing more than a little motor on a stick with a bag attached. Simply we move on to when the beta rolling beta bar starts. Right. Bigger motor, nice shiny aluminium exterior. These behind you, no longer made of metal, lots of Bakelite, lots of brown colour. So what's special about this machine? Well, this one benefited from a new range of industrial designers brought into companies to sort of streamline the products, make them look more glamorous, more elegant. So they were just practical about the earlier ones, and this, yes. is, this is a real designer job. Real design. So what, what's in it then? Smooth Bakelite hood. Ah, so that's Bakelite. And, of course, we have the headlight on the front. Headlight. That was just a gimmick, presumably. No, no. That was to find your hidden dirt. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> when we come round to us, the swinging 60s, where we see all the colour. Styles change. We have the new plastics. Right. Various colours. Still with the bags. Look very similar. And then we move round through to the 70s machines over there with the hard cases. So we've gone from these flimsy bags to holding the dust in a solid, rigid container. Right. But they've given up on the colour. Well, they have slightly. We've lost, yeah, the psychedelics of the 60s. <laughs> the swinging 60s saw domestic appliances promoted as fashion accessories, as well as simply for the job they did. Multicoloured machines were designed to appeal to a new wave of young people moving out of home and into their own flats. But there were more exciting developments than just bright colours on offer. There we are. Ah! Magic! You're very short of space, yeah. you can stick it in the wardrobe with your suitcase. There's the motor, and it even has its own cord rewind. That's very clever, isn't it? I wouldn't mind one of those. <laughs> really good. And what about this thing? This is the Space Age Hoover Constellation. Oh. Floats on its cushion of earth. It does look a bit like a satellite, doesn't it? It is, yes. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Right, I'm going to have a go. Hoover, Hoover, Hoover. Come on, Fido. Hoover, Hoover. Good dog. Good dog. Great. Thanks very much, Mike. Bye, Take yeah. care. See you next time.